Is it just me, or have you ever observed how some of the best texts are off syllabus? Way back in the day, I'm talking the mid-90s, I studied Latin A-level. For those of you outside the UK, A-levels are the exams you take at the age of 18 or thereabouts. Catullus, the first century BCE Roman poet, was one of our set authors, and we had to study a selection of his poems. Ones about kisses, sparrows, heartache, and light social satire. Now, my Latin teacher, who was a great formative influence on me, encouraged me to dig deeper and to read beyond the syllabus, which is always a good idea. So I borrowed a copy of a Catullus text, and it didn't take me long to find my way to his 63rd poem. I can't have been the first teenager to be drawn to that poem, nor the last. It appealed to me for its exotic schlock sensationalism, the transgressive excitement of it. I was a very naive kid. But coming back to it, many decades later. I can now see how it is so much more than that. It has a horrific and very real profundity that completely passed me by in my youth. It stands as an exploration of a perennial, near-universal theme, the tragedy of a self-made downfall, of self-entrapment. It stands for addiction, self-sabotage, those mistakes we can never outlive. I'm sure that anyone who's lived a certain number of years on this planet will find some personal resonance in it. And yet, in today's age, the poem has at least two eerily specific and literal parallels. First, that of being trapped within a religious or quasi-religious cult. And the second, near-literal parallel, is very much a 21st century phenomenon. Welcome to Ancient Classics. Poem 63, sometimes known by the name of its protagonist, Attis, is by anyone's standard a remarkable poem. Quinn, in his commentary, goes so far as to describe it as perhaps the most remarkable poem in Latin, and then quoting Elder as a study of fanatic devotion and subsequent disillusionment. It has the intense vividness of a nightmare. It's 93 lines long, which is a moderate length for Catullus, and it is written in the idiosyncratic Galliambic meter. In fact, it's the only lengthy surviving example in Latin, or actually Greco-Roman literature as a whole, I think. The meter, the flow, if you like, of this poem is, like the subject matter itself, intense. Another flashback to my youth. When I was younger, I knew that meter was a thing, but I couldn't really imagine why and how it was important. But at the time, I must admit, I hadn't really listened to hip-hop seriously. I can't say that I'm a hip-hop aficionado today. I like it, I listen to it occasionally, just enough to appreciate quite how important flow is to a rapper's artistry and to the audience's experience. So now all those classical commentaries obsessing over the nuances of meter don't seem quite so abstract and pointless to me because flow and meter, they're the same thing. Now, the galliambic meter of poem 63 is, according to West, a combination of a dimeter and a catalectic dimeter. That means that each line can be divided into two halves or metra, the second echoing the first, but truncated and ending in a pause, I think. But hey, one has to hear it. And with my fumbling Latin, there's no way I could pull off an adequate recitation, so I'd highly recommend checking out some recitations on YouTube. Fiant Lapide's rendition, link in the video description, is especially effective. Check out his rapid percussive delivery. Indeed, speaking of percussive delivery, Quinn, in his commentary, claims that the meter is intended clearly to represent the dialogue of kettle drum and cymbals. Not quite sure why he's so definitive and specific, but hey. The poem tells of how a youth, Attis, travels by sea to Phrygia and ventures into the dark forest precincts of the goddess Kibberley. Now there's so much I'd like to say about this poem and I'd like to dive deep into it. So I'll make this a multi-part video. Let's start from the beginning with the opening lines. Conveyed over deep seas on a swift ship, Attis eagerly set foot in the forests of Phrygia and came to the goddess's dark place, wreathed by trees. There, goaded by raging madness, unsound of mind, he castrated himself with a jagged flint. Talk about getting straight into it. Five lines is all it takes to trace Attis's journey across the sea to Kibberley's forest precinct and his self-castration. But we're told nothing about Attis's identity, his origins, or why he undertook this journey and self-mutilation. So who was Attis? The name Attis is closely associated with Kibberley and her cult. In some tellings, Attis is a Phrygian youth, a shepherd with whom Kibberley falls in love and points to be her chaste priest. 
Attis falls in love with a nymph, for which affair Kiberly punishes him, either with death or, according to the version recounted in Ovid's Fasti, by driving him mad and impelling him to self-castration. Or perhaps he's some kind of vegetation god originally. I'm not too interested in any of these versions of Attis, nor would it seem was Catullus. Because as far as this poem is concerned, Attis is a youth from a traditional Greco-Roman family, as becomes clear later in the poem. In this regard, Attis is a nondescript every person, and his situation is universalised. What about Attis's motivation? Again, we're given none, not yet at least. There's no suggestion that Attis was coerced or tricked into this. It seems to be their own decision. Later in the text, Attis gives something of an exploration. Veneris nemio odio, owing to an excessive hatred of Venus. Venus being, of course, the goddess of sexual desire. So the closest we get to a motivation is some kind of overwhelming hatred of or discomfort with his sexuality or sex in general, or perhaps even a kind of dysphoria if we can take Venus to stand in for the sexual organs. So the lack of context and build-up is shockingly jarring, but it also universalises this story. Catullus could have made this Attis a demi-divine figure, a lover of Kibberley or founder of her cult, but he doesn't. This Attis is anyone, someone like you or me, or your son or daughter, feeling what remained butchered, emasculated members defiling the soil with fresh gore, but aroused, she grasped the hand drum with her snowy white hands, your drum, your rights, Mother Kibberley. She shaked the bullhide drum with slender fingers, trembling. She began to sing to her companions. At the very start of this poem, Attis is described using masculine adjectives and participles. The opening phrase of this poem, conveyed across the sea, Wectus, that us ending is explicitly masculine, but now Attis is described in the feminine, Kitata, roused, with an a ending. And so, for the most part, throughout this poem, she remains, though I'm going to use the modern gender-neutral English, they. Now, I'm hardly the first to notice this shift in gender, the poem's famous for it. But the shift is more nuanced than it is often made out to be. For non-native Latin speakers like me, and I'm guessing you, in this day and age, primed as we are to expect the now notorious linguistic gender transition, it's difficult or impossible to reconstruct quite how the original audience would have experienced those lines. But I think it would have gone something like this. First, note how the new gender reveal plays out. Before coming straight out with the explicitly feminine participle kitata, Catullus teases expectations. The preceding phrase features a neuter plural participle and noun relicta membra, abandoned or remaining limbs or members. As anyone with a little bit of Latin will know, the a ending can signify either a feminine singular or a neuter plural, and word order is not determinative of meaning. So that phrase, it accord relicta sensit membra, thus he felt his remaining members, imagine the first audience unaware of this poem's gender transition trope. Relicta sensit. They'd hear or read the word relicta and think, ah, that can't be Attis, we've not yet encountered any female characters, so we better suspend our understanding. He's sensing, sense it, something neuter plural. What things? Uh, ew, his butchered members, as the phrase concludes. That would then have primed the original audience for another occurrence of a neuter plural ending in an a. So when a line later they hear the phrase niways kitata capit with snowy white hands that is aroused she holds the original audience's immediate instinct would be to suspend judgment on what kitata roused refers to expecting it to be some kind of neuter plural but as the sentence unfolded it would have then become clear that it couldn't be referring to a neuter plural it, it must refer to the primary actor i.e. Attis. And that conclusion would have been confirmed with the more easily construed feminine participle a daughter, a couple of lines later, i.e. just long enough for the realisation of the gender change to sink in. And whilst this feminine gender is maintained fairly consistently throughout the remainder of the poem, there are moments when Catullus briefly switches Attis back to the masculine, as if the vestiges of the old Attis remain, only to be crushed and overwhelmed as soon as they find expression. We'll come back to this linguistically coded concept of gender presently, 
But let's remind ourselves of the actions described in the passage. Attis begins to sing to her companions. Those companions have suddenly appeared in the poem. There's no mention of them at the start. The opening words, supralto vectus Attis, Attis was conveyed across the deep seas, vectus conveyed being singular, implies that Attis travelled alone. The next passage, their song to their companions, tells us more. Galai, come on, venture into the depths of Kibberley's forests. Together, go, wandering herd of the Dindomanian mistress, like exiles making for foreign lands. With me as your leader, you were my companions, followers on my path, and you endured the rough sea and the storms of the ocean, and you dismembered your genitals with excessive loathing of Venus. Now gladden the heart of the mistress with your frenzied misdeeds. May sluggish delay be gone from your heart. Go at once and follow on to the Phrygian home of Kibberley, to the Phrygian forests of the goddess, where the sound of cymbals resounds, where the drums echo, where the Phrygian plays a pipe deeply with a curved reed, where the ivy-garlanded minads violently toss their heads, where they enact the holy rituals with shrill screams, where that wandering coven of the goddess has grown accustomed to rampage. There we should hurry with swift paces. Attis addresses their companions as Galli. The Galli were the eunuch priests of Kibbele, in the real historical age that is. Galli, though, that's the feminine form. I think most commonly the priests were known as Galli, with an I, masculine plural that is, although not always. There is at least one other instance of the priests being called Galli in Greek, that time, with an alpha iota ending. So the feminine form is not unprecedented. But what about real life Galli? They were eunuchs, castrated males, but how did they present themselves? What gender identity did they adopt or have foisted upon them? As far as I'm aware, all the texts describing the historical galley were written by male outsiders from mainstream society, with more than an air of suspicion, revulsion, or perhaps prejudice. So we really don't have an idea of how the galley themselves viewed their own gender identities. Also, they are often conflated with the other eunuch priests of purportedly foreign goddesses like the Syrian goddess. I say purportedly foreign because, well, with syncretization and all that, I'm always quite sceptical of labelling deities and their cults as native, foreign, or whatever. It's always more complicated than that. Besides, the story goes that the rites of Kibberley were imported into Roman culture as early as the 3rd century BCE. Even so, there's always something from mainstream Roman society's perspective exotic, dangerous, or other about the cultists of Kibberley. The tension between the foreign or exotic and the native or naturalised Romanized element of the cults of Kibberley is hinted at in a near contemporary source written by a non-Roman looking in on the outside, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, in the generation or so after Catullus. And yet the thing which I have marvelled at most is this. Notwithstanding the influx into Rome of innumerable nations, which are under every necessity of worshipping their ancestral gods according to the customs of their respective countries, yet the city has never officially adopted any of those foreign practices, as has been the experience of many cities in the past. But even though she has, in pursuance of oracles, introduced certain rites from abroad, she celebrates them in accordance with her own traditions after banishing all fabulous claptrap. The rites of the Idean goddess, Kibberley, are a case in point. For the Praetors perform sacrifices and celebrate games in her honour every year according to the Roman customs, but the priests and the priestesses of the goddess are Phrygians, and it is they who carry her image in procession through the city, begging alms in her name according to their custom, and wearing figures upon their breasts and striking their drums while their followers play tunes on their pipes in honour of the mother of the gods. But by law and decree of the Senate, no native Roman walks in procession through the city arrayed in a parthi-coloured robe, begging alms or escorted by pipers or worships the goddess with the Phrygian ceremonies. So cautious are they about admitting any foreign religious customs, and so great is their aversion to pompous display that is wanting in decorum. Interestingly, Dionysius refers to the cultists as female priestesses. I'm not aware that biological females officiated at the rites of Kibberley, at least not in the cults in its mature form. So perhaps Dionysius is characterising the castrated galley as women. Whatever. It's clear enough that the castrated galley presented themselves and were presented as something other than traditionally masculine. 
whether as women or as some other category. Some have argued in recent years that the galley should be considered to be trans women in the modern sense. To quote Lynn Conway discussing evidence of a gallus found in Britain not too far from Hadrian's Wall, it is so sad when archaeologists naively obscure and inherently ridicule this girl's gender identity by calling her a cross-dressing eunuch. Such comments reveal their lack of understanding of human nature in the large and their lack of appreciation for how sophisticated some ancient civilizations were when accommodating gender variations. Those who are knowledgeable about transgenderism and transsexualism will recognize that this person is not a eunuch, a male gendered boy or man who has been castrated, in ancient times usually a slave, nor is she a transvestite, an intact male-gendered man who is cross-dressing for male erotic satisfactions. Instead, this person was very likely an intensely transsexual girl who desperately sought and willingly underwent a voluntary emasculation surgery at a young age, probably her early teens, and then lived as a female priestess afterwards. Well, I don't know anything about these kind of things. But more importantly, like I say, we don't have any first-hand written accounts from the galley themselves. And besides, each gallus would have had their own take on why they chose to, or were forced, perhaps, to undergo the process of becoming a gallus. Besides, as was pointed out in a paper from which I took that quotation, Conway's commentary was apparently based on the features of a picture which wasn't even of the British gallus anyway. So it's really not for anyone today to comment too definitively on the galleys' gender identities. Now, lest my concern about the nuance of the galleys' lived experience seems a bit off, well, there's no reason to suspect that Catullus cared too much about it either. Just as his poem is not a religious treatise on the myth or the rituals of Kibberley, so it is not a sensitive portrayal or sociological study of real-life galley. And again, if Catullus or we were to focus too closely on real-life galley, then that would be at the expense of the more universally applicable psychological themes that the poem explores. But back to the passage. Like I say, these companions, these galli, have appeared out of nowhere, it seems. But Attis suggests that they accompanied them on their voyage, and moreover, that Attis was their leader. Is Attis perhaps trying a little too hard to make themselves out to be the leader, claiming some kind of agency and control? Quinn seems to think so. He notes that Attis's attempt to assert his leadership over his companions is a pathetic betrayal of his dependence on them. He clutches at command to conceal his helplessness from himself. But on with the poem. The counterfeit woman Attis sang this to her companions, and the coven urgently wailed with trembling voices. The light hand drum resounded, the hollow cymbals clashed, and the chorus with hasty step came to verdant Ida, the counterfeit woman. That's a rather inadequate translation. I've borrowed the term from Gould. The Latin is nota mulia. Mulia means woman. Nota is a derogatory word usually used to refer to a person born out of wedlock, a bastard, if you will. Here, that term is used in apposition or adjectively with a woman, a bastard woman. So counterfeit woman kind of captures it without fully doing it justice. Crazed, panting, Wandering Attis led them through the dark woods to the sound of a drum like an unbroken heifer escaping the yoke and the Galli follow their rushing leader. And so when they, exhausted by so much effort, reached the domain of Kibberley, they fell asleep without taking dinner. Sluggish sleep overcomes their eyes with a beguiling slumber and the rabid fury of mind abates with the gentle release. And then, next morning, Attis wakes up with a clear head. That's when the tragedy unfolds. But we'll come to that next time. Meantime, check out the poem for yourself. I'll link the online text in Latin and English in the description. And also, like and subscribe, and we'll be back soon.